Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 769 for June 10th, 2023, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchotts, but this is not a Programming by Stealth episode. It's a Chit Chat Across the Pond light, at least within our personal definition of light. How's that, Bart? It might even be genuinely light. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You said you're going to be uh, talking about some developer stuff. So that sounds a little a little more light than most normal humans would. But for us, that's light, right? Right. And it sort of came about for two reasons. So the first is it's been a week in work where I've had to do a lot of programming for my work hat. And I, there's only so much my brain can do. And I tried to write the show notes on Friday evening and my brain was like, nope. For a start, I'm still in PowerShell mode. This bash thing is not happening. There were dollar signs everywhere there shouldn't be. There, it, it, oh, it was a mess. It was a giant mess is what it was. And I'm also really keen to talk to someone fun and nerdy, and I can't think of anyone more fun and mer- more nerdy than you, about, well, frankly, a part of Apple's keynote. Um, I'm already thinking ahead to Let's Talk Apple for this month, thinking how on earth can I fit everything I want to say from that amazing keynote into one Let's Talk Apple. That's going to be, I don't know how I'm going to do that. Well, you're going to take the 30 foot level, right? Or 100 foot level, 100 meter level. Right. But even when you zoom out, it's it's been a long time since so much has happened in one keynote. Yeah, definitely. Because they dropped a bunch of cool stuff in a press release two days in. Like on the Wednesday, we got a press release, some service updates, little things like, Sharing pass keys with a group of friends. Basically, they Sherlocked one password for families, just on a press release. Well, uh, we get to sh- they, they Sherlock yeah, I mean, okay. a feature of one password for families. But yeah, yeah, it, it was um, shared uh, AirTag. A friend of mine is waiting for me to answer a question. Actually, um, a, a listener of the show is waiting for me to answer the question oh. of: Is there any reason why I shouldn't use uh, pass keys? Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use keychain and one password at the same time. And I didn't even get around to responding before. Now I, the answer is getting harder and harder to tell. And it's probably a good thing for one password. They've pivoted to an enterprise product because their focus has really shifted to the enterprise with integrations with I, single I, sign-on and stuff. Don't say that as though it's shifted away from the, the home and family because that is not true. Mm, They've added. Correct. I'm saying it from the point of view of the company not being damaged by Apple adding this feature. Like I'm saying it because I want them to survive and thrive. And if they were still dependent on only families. On only families. I'd worry. Just, they're not shifted. They're not pivoted away from, which is what you said was why I was saying they've added. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That they've yeah. expanded their yeah. Yeah, um, they're not a one trick pony. Correct. Yes, that is a good way of putting it. And but anyway, of course, that's the other, the other. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly off topic. But anyway, like I say, right, you've made my point here. There is so much in WWDC, but the bit that everyone else isn't talking about as much. I've listened to lots of podcasts, and everyone is obsessed with the and one more thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. But they're all focusing on the hardware, which is a version one piece of hardware at a very high price that's not going to be available anywhere until January at the earliest and US only at first. And I'm like, okay, it's interesting. It's more than I was expecting for a version one product. I I was, it's more than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. But that, 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 like, if I may steal your analogy... That's not what blew my dress up. That sort of ruffled it a bit. Yeah. But what blew my dress up was Vision OS. I was not expecting Vision OS. It I'm actually it glad you blew said, my mind. Let me let me say again what you said. Reinforce it is everybody I've tried to talk to about it, including Steve, wants to talk about the price. Wants to talk about the hardware, and it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all going to work itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just okay, fine. I mean, that's been on a trajectory, a very, very slow trajectory to getting better and better and better, not getting much cheaper, but we could argue about what the price is versus something more about 40 years ago, whatever. Sure. Let's talk about what we saw, the vision of the future. And I told Steve, it was, for me, it was like the first time Steve and I talked to our friend Ron over CUC Me, which was a video conferencing app. It was a one by one inch uh, picture of him moving at maybe four frames a second in maybe or 32 pixels. Frame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just ridiculous. And we all went, whoa. 
because we could see what it was going to be. And I had kind of that whoa feeling. It sounds like you did too. I did too. I absolutely, <clears throat> I absolutely did too. Because to me, this was as this is the next revolution in computing. So I, you and I probably have this in common. We started computers on the command line. That was the computer interface. I started on on on, on a Mac. Oh, okay. Well, well actually, case, it started on okay. a teletype. Let me, let me, you're right. <laughs> oh, okay. You've outdone me now. And cards. <laughs> Punch cards. And cards. Okay, no, you've really outdone me now. <laughs> um, the floppy disks had already shrunk when I started. Mm. Um, and they had become not floppy. So they were already an anachronism. Um, <laughs> and I really thought it was silly that they were called floppy disks. Like, well, this they're floppy, floppy on the inside. Oh, I found they're that crunchy out on the too, outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Armadillo. <laughs> Oh, anyway, dear. OK, so, yeah, so I started off life on the command line and the closest we got to a visual interface was something called a TUI, which is where you use ASCII characters to draw a sort of a kind of a GUI with text, mm. right? Like putting uh, borders like around perfect. things. And- yeah. Yeah, Word Perfect was like this blue screen with white text and there was a top row of text was in yellow. Oh yeah. And every other letter was underlined. And if you held down the alt key and that letter, then this menu would appear, which would just be a box of characters over the other boxes of characters, and then you could use the arrow keys to pick something from the menu and that was like <laughs> a gooey-ish, <laughs> right? And then the first time my mind got a little bit blown was when Windows 3.1 came out. Because you could go on your command line and type W-I-N and hit enter. And this app would launch that let you launch other apps. And those little apps were in floaty windows and things. And you had little icons and whatnot. That was so you ooh. saw Windows 3.1 before you saw any Mac operating systems? Because wasn't... Long before. Yeah, but, I didn't go to the Mac until Mac But OS the Mac 10. operating system in some form existed before that, right? It... They were certainly... A, they exist. They coexisted for sure. Um, and probably the Mac probably predated because the Mac goes back to 82. 84. Famously. 83. Well, 1982 won't be like 1982. Because that was, was 1984. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that was the name of that movie. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I knew it was an Orwell reference. I don't, know, I don't know why I thought it was 82. Anyway, okay, 1984. And yeah, no, Windows 3.1 is later than that. Oh, yeah, no, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's much later than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I literally. Lost oh, yeah, a it's nineteen ninety-two. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I yes. lost a decade. Just poof. <laughs> well, anyway, so, that's okay. We forgive you. You came over to the right side. But, I did uh, very, very eventually. But when you but, saw a windowed opter- operating system, a true GUI, that was a a step function. That was a step function, and then Windows ninety five blew my mind because in Windows ninety five, you never saw the command line. You turned the computer on. It made a bloom, bloom, bloom noise. A little field came up and your icons were just there. And that was it. That was the whole computer was this but was that, user interface. was that a mind-blowing jump or no? That was pretty substantial, actually, because Windows 3.1 was a place you went when you weren't playing games to do a few things. It was like an app with apps in it because you had to start it by typing W-I-N and hitting enter. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, you know, you'd go stick in your flopper and go see, you know, a colon and, you know, name of your exe file for your game or whatever. And then maybe when you were done playing games, you type win to go play with paint or write if you want to do some homework. Mm -hmm. But it it was like an app that had little apps inside that it still wasn't quite the, wait a minute, the computer can just be pictures. Which, of course, the Mac, that was the Mac's whole thing, right? Hello. And (laughs) up it came with pictures, right? But we didn't get that till Windows 95. And that's, I think that's pretty mind-blowing change. So that was a pretty big change that happened in my early computing life. And the next time my mind was blown was when we replaced indirect, like, so the icons and the windows, you manipulated them indirectly. Your hand moved a mouse, the mouse moved a cursor, the cursor moved things. So yes, your hand was manipulating the icons, but it needed an intermediary, right? You had you had to use the mouse to control the thing on the screen that was actually manipulating the interface. So I'm the just next laughing because you got there so much unlock. later. Oh, slide to unlock? Okay. Like, that was, like, I, I still remember, I remember everyone huddled around me in the office when my, because in Ireland we didn't get the first generation iPhone, we got the iPod Touch. And I ordered one straight away. And it arrived while I was in work in IT services. And everyone was huddled around for the unboxing. 
and just the act of sliding your finger and watching zero lag on a touchscreen and having the thing open blew everyone's mind. I was like, huh. oh my God. Direct touch, like directly manipulating an interface. That was absolutely revolutionary. And what I saw with, with uh, Vision OS, I, I keep on getting the name wrong because it was rumored to be Reality OS for so long. I'm going to say it wrong a few times. That was the next time my mind was blown to that same level. To me, what everyone else has been doing is like a little gimmick for adding on to something else, a, a, a way to play games, a way to have meetings with silly bodies with no legs. Mm -hmm. It was like this piece of technology in search for a reason. And what Apple have is a computer operating system. They have a way of manipulating the world. Well, the, one of the phrases they've used now, and I think this really encapsulates it, is spatial computing. Yes. And that yeah, was the they've thing. They've added a dimension. That was, I, I think, I mean, I'm a productivity hound. I don't game. Uh, I, doing some exercise is kind of a fun thing. I can see that. But... And, and I'm not against anybody else enjoying gaming on a on a headset. That's just fine if that's what they want to go do. I just it doesn't interest me. But productivity out in space and having my computing out in the space around me that that was more mind blowing. Steve specifically asked yeah. me, did I feel that kind of leap going to the iPhone from the BlackBerry? And I said, no, that wasn't. Wow. I mean, it was cool. It's really cool, but it was doing the same things I could do before in a different way. And I, I mean, I guess technically some of that is what's true that here. Is, it to is, and that's kind of what extent. I like about the evolutions. Right? It's just, it's gotten better to do what I need to do. I was writing documents in WordPerfect on the TUI. I'm writing documents on Mac OS X in a really shiny GUI app, and I will <laughs> be writing documents in spatial computing. So to some extent, I'm continuing to do what I do, and that's why it blew my dress up. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So... I was thinking about this a lot, like how best to express why my mind was blown. So everyone was expecting Apple to do a headset that you would wear while you walked around a la Google Glass. That's mm -hmm. what everyone thought was going to happen, which to me is mobile computing, right? You, It is designed to be used on the move, a bit like an iPhone is a mobile computer, right? You walk around while you're tapping away on your iPhone, that's all perfectly fine. This isn't that. This is the ultimate portable computer. This is a laptop on steroids. This is Wait, a laptop how's portable with an different infinite than display. Mobile? How's portable portable than... means you move it around and then you settle in to do something, right? Oh, when you okay. use a laptop, <laughs> right? You okay. bring it with you and then you settle yourself down and you do something. So we're not going to use it crossing the street looking down at the ground about to get hit by a Certainly car. Certainly not. <laughs> Not this product. And Apple may do something else in the future that is also spatial computing, mm -hmm. but more of a stripped down spatial computing, which would be some sort of glasses like thing, which would basically be a bit like the iPhone to the Mac. Yes, it's familiar, but it's a very stripped down minimalist OS. This wasn't that. To me, this is the next laptop. Only instead of mm -hmm. me wondering about do I get a 12 inch or a 15 inch, I have an infinity inch. <laughs> is right, it an right. infinity inch laptop? It's small, it's portable, I bring it where I want to go, and then I settle down and I do something. So maybe I settle down on a standing desk, maybe I settle down on a counter, maybe I settle down on the couch, maybe I settle down in a lounge somewhere in an airport. Or an airplane. But like a laptop, or an airplane, like a laptop, I settle down and I do something. Mm -hmm. And instead of me being confined to a little screen, I now have the freedom to arrange my work as broadly as possible and there's i genuinely find small screens claustrophobic i hate <laughs> working on small screens it it's not just irritating it's it's deeper than irritating it, you feel it, like you're I in the center seat in. on a on a five seat row in an airplane with your elbows touching yes. and you tried to eat with a spork <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's a brian regan yeah, a little joke too good a description but yeah i know that that works pretty darn well yeah exactly so this gives you all of your apps, and it immediately, you could see from the demo, they didn't start with a game or with floating avatars in a pretend meeting. They started with a really ordinary app. They showed us a music app. They showed us Safari. Yeah, they showed us FaceTime and stuff. 
But it wasn't a virtual meeting room where no one has any legs and everyone's pretending to be in space, a la Mark Zuckerberg's demo of software he didn't have. They showed well, us you a still well don't have thought legs. out. Right, but you're also you're in a window, right? You're, it's yeah. play. It's it's animated playing cards that you arrange as you wish. Not right, right, right. A virtual room you're all sharing, mm-hmm. which is way more inclusive, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it is a desktop operating system with an extra dimension, and they don't just have a shiny demo like Mark Zuckerberg had. Like the, I watched Mark Zuckerberg's keynote, thinking I was seeing I would see the future of computing, and I was like, meh. I could I couldn't care less. It was like, oh look, some shiny graphics of an OS that doesn't exist. That's a vague idea in Mark Zuckerberg's head. It, well, and this isn't back to my favorite mantra. It didn't seem to solve any problems. And to me, one of the problems that I see being solved here, my immediate thought was, you're in a cubicle with one cruddy, low resolution monitor doing some boring task, whatever it is, in a corporate world. And to suddenly be able to have two 50 inch monitors side, you know, at a, at a slight angle to each other and working back and forth and becoming more efficient and not noticing all the cubicle-ness around you. Um, one of the things John Syracuse mentioned on uh, the Accidental Tech Podcast was you really will need to dial that, uh, that fake background in of, you know, trees and rivers and waterfalls or whatever, the forest, uh, because... Yeah. You otherwise you'll be looking at the wall in front of you in your cubicle, and your display would be on the other side of it. <laughs> so you need I mean, to be able to depend on where that. you are. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right? If you're doing get, it in a cubicle or on yeah. an airplane, you you need to get rid of that wall oh, in front yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and so th- there's uh, a few things struck me. So the first thing is even from just a segment on the main keynote. So leaving aside the fact that I went nerdier, which I will get to. Good. But just the bit they showed in the main keynote, you could already tell that there was a design language. There was a consistent concept of how a UI would behave. They showed us, for example, the fact that every app, every window, and they still call them windows, has this little drag bar underneath. So it's a little a little vertical bar that looks like the bar on our iPhones, but it's just a little bit below each window. And that's the bar that you look at. And then you can use your fingers to pinch and zoom to make the window bigger or smaller. And you can also push it away because you have a third dimension now. So you can push the window away, move it left or right. And you do that with that drag bar. So you I, can literally I just miss arrange the drag bar. your windows. I, I saw the little uh, like curved thing in the, in the rounded rectangle in the bottom right to drag the size of the window. But I didn't notice that you did anything with the bar across the center bottom. Yeah, so that center bottom is basically the... Cre- so on the Mac, we move a window by grabbing its toolbar, right? So at the top of the window next to the travel lights, you grab, drag, grab anywhere there and you can move the window around. Well, in Vision OS, it's that little bar that looks like the iPhone screen's little bar that's just underneath the window. Yeah. You grab that and that lets you move the window in all three dimensions. So you can move it left or right to get it out of your way, but also push and pull. So if you're working in a document, you can pull it right up to the front. And then if you need to glance over at a graph or at a spreadsheet or something for some numbers, you can put it off to the side and even into the background or anything you particularly don't care about right now. You don't make it go away. You just, I mean, it's like stage manager on absolute steroids, (laughs) right? You have, because you have your little windows, but you can push them back and Because it anchors your stuff, not in your field of view. So that's the cool thing compared to Google Glass. This interface isn't anchored relative to where you're you're looking. It's anchored on the world. And so when you turn your head, your windows stay put. And according to everyone who I've read, the thing they all say from their demos, because some of the lucky people got to have real demos of this thing at WWDC, they say that the, unlike if you use AOR on your iPhone, this thing is rock solid. The stuff does not move in the Mm. world. If you put a window over your coffee table, it stays over your coffee table, rigid, perfect. So it's utterly believable, which is what you need. I I hadn't even thought about that being a really important feature of this, but you're right. You need it to stay where it is. If I'm going to turn to the right and I want to see Excel and I want to turn to the left and look at my photos, well, my photos better be there when I get back with my head. Right, yeah. Otherwise, it's not spatial computing, right? You're supposed to be able to arrange your digital universe around you. Mm -hmm. So it has to be 
rock solid. And actually, you have to press and hold the digital crown to basically recenter the universe. So if you have your window spread out where the coffee table is the middle, if you don't want to, if you want to change your mind, the light has moved or something and you want that to become the middle, you turn to where you want the new middle and you press and hold the digital crown and then the virtual universe shifts. And now it's anchored. (laughs) So I'm sitting up on my couch and then I start feeling lazy and I want to turn 90 degrees and relax back. I might want to rotate the universe. Interesting. I hadn't heard about that. So one of the things that I've... I probably should have gone back and rewatched the keynote uh, if I'd realized uh, I wanted to talk more about this. But the I've gotten myself stuck on thinking a lot about when they said you can plug this into a Mac and now everything on your Mac, now you're arranging these. When you've basically got spaces, mm. Bart's favorite thing, spaces, <laughs> but you can have them all over in space out in front of you. And I've forgotten what I felt like and, and exactly what the details are of what you get from Reality OS without the Mac. So I know you've got still got applications though, right? You've got photos. Oh yeah, it's a full computer. Things. None, every iPad app. Every iPad app. Okay. Right now. On, oh, so on, this is you got before iPad developers OS and write Mac a line OS. of code. Okay. Yeah. So before so like you can run an iPad app on the Mac, you can run iPad apps on Reality OS out of the box. Okay. They just appear as Windows in Reality OS. Sorry, Vision OS. Ah. Oh, I said it too. Sorry, Vision yeah, OS. Yeah, we're both in it because so long, so long that the rumor mill has been telling us to prepare for reality OS. It's just, just so think, stuck in my brain. Just keep thinking Marvel. Marvel, Marvel, Vision, 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 Vision. Anyway, right. uh, even before a single developer writes a single app, you already have the full stable of iPad apps ready to go on day one. And that's without anyone doing anything extra. So that already tells you that this is a full-on OS already. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, and of course, everything you write in Swift UI will be transformed automatically because the whole point of Swift UI, the reason Apple have been pushing it for so long, is because Swift UI is built around the concept of a, it's a, it's a declarative language. So you what, don't. What does that mean? I knew you'd ask. <laughs> I've been trying to think about the perfect way to explain it. So. Do you remember in Programming by Stealth, we had a big discussion early on about the difference between using a P tag to say this is a paragraph versus just sticking two BR tags to say make an empty line. Remember, this is the light audience. So I know. So the point is you're saying what something is. You're not saying I need you to make it four pixels wide and I need you to make the text bold and blue. You're saying this is a heading. This is a button. Okay. This is a toggle. So you're declaring what you want. So you're literally saying to the computer, I want a window with two buttons at the bottom. I want a scrollable list in the middle and then I want a heading above that. And I mean, obviously there's a syntax to it and it's a bit more codey, but you're declaring what you want. And then that same declaration is used to build your watch app, it's used to build your Mac app, and it's used to build your iPad and your iPhone apps and your Reality OS app. So that in your declaration of your desire gets translated into different pixels with different looks and feels and different responses depending on the environment they're in. Okay. Okay. And that means that even if you take a modern a modern Swift UI app without the developer writing a line of code, it's not just available in Reality OS. It's na- it already feels native in Reality OS. Sorry, Vision OS. Vir- <laughs> Vision OS. Vision OS. Because Swift UI will translate it to be the way their buttons are and so forth. Okay. Okay. So do you think that their invention of uh, Swift was actually with this kind of vision <laughs> uh, in mind? At least part of the push was. But it was also, even if this wasn't happening, so we know, we know for a fact that there's seven years of development into this thing. So for at least the last seven years, we have to look back at everything Apple were doing. And they already knew they were working on this for the last seven years. So everything from the last seven years, we now have to reappraise. Everything they said in every WWDC for seven years back, we should now be looking at going, what were they really saying? <laughs> and... They were they were pushing Swift UI and stuff, and they were selling it because you had iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, and the Apple Watch and the Apple TV. So they already had a lot of personas for your Swift UI. It was already well worth your effort. 
But they also knew it would be even more worth your effort when Vision OS came out too. Okay. Okay. I, I, the best thing about the internet is someone will go back and search that and show like a timeline of remember when they said this and then they said this and then they said this and be able to, whether the story was really there or not, it'll be built, right? True. True. So I, I can say I was already sufficiently impressed by how well thought out this UI was just from the main keynote. But me being a, you know, being someone who writes code, I won't call myself a developer, but I am a coder. I obviously watch two keynotes every time there's a WWDC. I watch the, you know, the public keynote and I watch the state of the platforms. Which is also which public. Is, yeah, it's, but less they're accessible. all public, right? Every single, <laughs> yeah, every single session is public, actually, but it's not aimed at. Yeah. Right. The intended audience is not the press. The intended audience is the developers. And it's it's notable that you don't see the same Apple people on the two. You don't you see the people who actually write the APIs on the state of the platforms. You don't see the famous executives, right? You don't see your Craig Federighi's sure. and stuff. You see, you know, lower level, you know, lower level, more hands-on people. Anyway, there's a chapter, and the nice thing about the state of the platforms is it's actually chapterized. Hmm. So when you go to the when you go to it in your browser, you can jump straight to the chapter you want, and they have a chapter on Vision OS. And so even if you don't watch the rest of the keynote, because it gets it gets quite in the weeds um, at times, but when they jump to Vision OS, they pull out of the weeds because this is a whole new OS. The developers need to be taught first principles, which is fantastic because oh. first principles are human friendly. <laughs> so they actually start by saying, they, they explain the concept of the UI. So they say that there are three atoms of content in Re Vision OS. So most apps are going to be windows, which you should imagine mentally as a pane of frosted glass. Oh, and on that okay. pane of frosted glass, you will paint your app. And you have all of the standard stuff, so sidebars and menus and all of the normal components that make up an iPad app, a Mac app. They're all there. They're all ready for you in SwiftUI. All of the standard controls have been adapted to make them fit in that space and they explain you know how they've made the font a little bit bolder because that works better they white text they have discovered works really well in a, a or v or much better than black text and so they've done a whole bunch of translation to make it all work but anyway they've done that hard work and it, it's just there for you uh, but then so that's one atom is the window which is a frosted pane of glass the other atom is what they call a volume which is for a constraint, it's a box. So your app can exist in a box if you have three-dimensional content. If your app makes sense as some sort of a three-dimensional experience, you can exist it in a box. And then the last thing you can do is an immersive experience, which is the equivalent of a full screen app. There are your three ways of doing things, right? It's a pane of glass, a box, and a universe. You can make a universe. I'm going to interrupt the audience real quick. Uh, my granddaughter <laughs> appears to have escaped and joined us here for a second. <laughs> you can say hello and then you got to go. Hi, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> the live show is used to seeing that happen, but uh, that was a, a special Aww, little surprise very for sweet. the chat. <laughs> she loves, very, sweet. She's very comfortable on the microphone. I don't know where she gets in. <laughs> I think growing up in the pandemic, I think kids are not afraid of cameras or microphones. Maybe that's, that's, that's what where it Granny is. was for ages. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I'm going to back you up to where I, before I got yeah. distracted, was you started talking about the volume, you, about some box. Is this the 3D hmm. space that your pane of glass will be within? Like you don't let it get closer than this or farther than that? Well, no. So you can say that my app doesn't live in a window. My app instead lives in this volume. Oh. And so you as a developer would say, I'm writing an app that is three-dimensional. So if you're writing a player for 3D oh. movies, you would define that as a volume. And then the person can control, basically, they can stretch and shrink the box, but it will stretch and shrink in three dimensions because it has a depth. Okay. okay. But you can so still that, pick it up and move it. So it's for 3D stuff. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. It's for but 3D stuff. It might stuff. be a visual visualizer for... Um for a 3D CAD. model or something. By the way, I do yeah. want to say, when they showed the 3D CAD model and the people walking around it, they said that was PTC. 
That was a company that used to be called Parametric Technology Corporation. I think they don't go by that anymore. They just go by PTC. But that was the primary application that I used and then supported and uh, was probably one of the places I spent the most amount of money in, in my corporate job. And I was on the board of directors of the International Users Group for PTC. So I went, yay, PTC! <laughs> cool. So personal cool. excitement. So that would be an example yeah. of an application that would use the volume. But you don't have to use volume. You can use the pane of glass if you're a 2D Yeah, app. so you as, yeah, you as a developer would decide what makes sense. So if I was writing a music player or something, I would want a pane of glass. But if I was writing a cat app, I would absolutely want a volume. So what and about then, the apps that they showed that have pieces that can come out, like you're watching a basketball game and there's a panel that can come out and kind of floating in, in another piece of space that shows the stats on the player or something? Well, we, give me a sec to come back to that because I want to get okay. the three atoms out before we, we zoom oh, in okay. a little bit more. So the third atom then is a fully immersive universe. So you can basically say, I want to design... A, an immersive experience, which means it's effectively the full screen version in 3D, right? Everything else goes away and my experience is the only thing the user sees. So okay. they would often be, the, the main thing Apple demoed for the purpose of those is a customized version of their beautiful Mount Hood. So you would have some sort of like a koi pond that you could then enable as your fake background to replace your cubicle. And that would be an app that would be a fully immersive app that you could then use oh. as your background. Oh, that's a and separate... And it could be just koi swimming around or something. So that would be a separate app from the thing that you're watching or, you know, I've got Excel because I'm a nerd. 20 I'm windows doing Excel, open, yeah. but I've got, I've got, I'm inside a koi pond or something. You could do that, or it could be an experience like a fully three-dimensional movie of some sort, right? Some sort of interactive three-dimensional experience. A game or something would also be an example of or, something that you would do as a full screen or, or sport, walking or inside the pyramids. Right, I mean, exactly, or yes. In, or exploring in some sort of, yeah, or anatomy. Or, I mean, the, the, the possibilities Ooh, are anatomy. Endless. Ooh, I want to go inside the human body. Right, yeah, exactly, right? Okay. So you, you, you endless. So there are your three big picture atoms. But okay. your, if you have a window-based app, you don't have to have just one window. You can have other windows, which you should keep close to your main window so that they... When you use the drag bar, they'll all move together. Mm -hmm. But you can have other ones and they will be in the Z axis and they will come towards the user. So any new stuff you open is in front of your main pane of glass. They're little mini oh. panes of glass that are in front of. Why now the thing that? they... Huh. Well, they said they've done a lot of research and that you should use the Z dimension, but don't go mad. Oh, uh, okay. A so just give it a little Z. bit of depth towards you. Okay. And they demoed it actually in, so in, so, okay, so I went three levels deep, right? So first level public keynote, second level state of the platform, third level, they actually have a session called S Principles of Spatial Design. Hmm. And they explain the computer science they've put into figuring out what does and doesn't work, what's easy for the user, what's hard for the user, do's and don'ts. And one of the things they say is never, ever make your, th your text three-dimensional and they demo it. It's Awful. Three-dimensional <laughs> text looks terrible. Well, you're they watching it in 2D, so how do you know? Oh, no, you, like, you can see, you can take a photo of something and know it looks horrible, right? Like, I can take an animation of a piece of text and wiggle it left and right, and on a 2D screen, I can still tell that that's not easy to read. Hmm. Right? Okay. Because it looks embossed, and it, that's not yeah. easy to read. It's much easier to read a flat thing. Like, it, trust me, okay. it, it was okay. really obvious. They also demoed that you do not use colored text. You use backgrounds, colored backgrounds with white text. And they show you clearly which what doesn't, doesn't work. And so they walk through all of these principles of design, how many points you need to have on things, how you should put your radiuses and stuff. And they demo it to you, wh why it doesn't work. And when you see the do's and don'ts, you're like, okay, thank goodness they worked this out. So the developers already have a real head start here and not breaking our brains. Um, I, I appreciate what they're saying, and they're probably correct in what they're saying not to do. But this is a cl classic place where Apple, in my opinion, breaks a lot of usability when they do things like uh, the translucent um, menu bar on the Mac, 
where it was changing colors right to left based on the background that you have of the uh, your background screen. And it made suddenly like white text wouldn't work on the left hand side, but it was working on the right because it was too light on the left and dark on the right. And they, I don't know, they get into that translucency thing just a wee bit more than is usable for a lot of people. Uh, they have gotten much better at making that work intelligently, right? You're right, when they started doing it, it was awful. But modern Mac OS is actually, uh, they tend to fade right, out very well, so it actually works. I haven't noticed it in a while, and maybe it's some of that experience that they had. But remember, it was yeah. a while before we were able to even shut the darn thing off. And it was like, oh, thank goodness I can turn that off because now I can read my menu bar. Yeah, now it's an accessibility feature, which is what it is, right? So that's, <laughs> that's important. Yeah. Uh, the other really important thing I need to say is that they made a very big point of this in one of the three levels deep. I don't remember at which level they got into this. This might have been state of the platform. But Windows have what they have named adornments. So a menu bar, like at the top of, say, the Mail app, that doesn't have to be in your main window. Hmm. You can detach that and have it nearby. As a little floating up, a little floating rounded rect, just a little bit above or a little bit to the side. And they call those adornments. Ooh. And so you and it actually looks way better to have an Do adornment. Do they have to be rectangles? To a, Could it be a circle with that you had to spin? <laughs> you really annoy people. I mean it could be anything, but if you're gonna right. use the out of the box, you you get very pretty rounded rectangles. A bit okay. like the the, the the flattened dock in modern versions of Mac OS. That's sort hmm. of a very pleasingly rounded rectangle. And it will sit just above, just below, just to the left, just to the right. You can have your adornments wherever you okay. want them. But Would they those are also be good. slightly closer to you? They are, yes. Okay. They're slightly, slightly in the Z-axis. So again, giving you some depth feel. Yes. Interesting. And they also talk about how you show what is currently selected. The other thing they've thought out, which has really impressed me, is privacy. So this operating system, the pointer is your eyes. So you, you can use a mouse like you can use a mouse on the iPad, but you don't have to, and that's not the primary driver. So like the mouse on the iPad is a bonus extra, your eyes are the cursor in Vision OS. So you look at what you want and it responds to you like the Apple TV does, but it's just sort of a little wobble. Like the thing you're selecting is... It slightly, slightly pulls out. It's actually all of the icons have layers and they actually show you how to make an icon. And so it has to be three layers uh, and they will round them and they will do the specular highlights and stuff. But you, the developer, write a three layered icon. I do remember seeing do... this with, I think it was maybe the photos icon and they kind of, they kind of showed it to you at, at an angle. So you could see that the little mm. flower was in front of a little background in front of another background, like a mat, a, a mat framing. Yes. But I do want to say that that's another area where I don't think they're actually really good at this. And, and the perfect example of that is in, on the Apple TV, when you've, when you've hovered over uh, an episode, it's often, or, or even a show that you want to watch, it's really hard to tell which one you've selected. And there's, a, again, an accessibility feature where you can have it draw a white box around it. To everybody listening, if you didn't know that, go turn that on. You'll be amazed how much more easily you'll be able to tell what you've selected. So they, they may underdo the vividness of what you've selected is what we say. Yeah. Yeah. And they also, there are, from day one, there are accessibility features already in Vision OS. So there are yeah. already things you can turn on for people with reduced vision and stuff that's already there, which is kind of impressive. Did you learn anything so, in the State of the Union about the touch stuff with the fingers? Or is that just... Yeah, that so that, comes that's purely a gesture. You? Mm -hmm. that, that, that is how you... In, so you're looking... So your, your gaze is the movement of the mouse, for mm -hmm. want of a better description. The act of clicking the mouse is just pinching your fingers. So it doesn't matter where you do that gesture, because there are 12, is it, cameras? As long as your hand is somewhere within the field of view of the headset, it's, it can recognize your hand and it can see the gesture. So you just move the, the thumb and the whatever you name that finger, and that counts as a click. So mm -hmm. you just look at what you want to do and you just move your, your thumb and finger and you click. And you just make a hand gesture to grab the, the bar if you're looking at the bar and move it in or out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't matter where your hands are. You don't have to reach into the world. They, they can be anywhere. It's just, a, it's just the direction of movement that matters, not the positioning in 3D space. Right, right. I wonder on that one, everything I've heard so far is it's really an easy gesture to do. But I am relatively certain I will double tap accidentally that my fingers will just kind of, I don't know, spasm to, to do twice. 
Um, I have that problem when I'm tapping on the iPhone, I'm trying to type or something. I have a tendency to double tap things. Um, but that just might be an accessibility issue for me. I don't know. I don't know how it would respond, uh, obviously, since I haven't played with it. But anyway, mm-hmm. so where I was getting to, so your interaction is your eyes. Okay. So oh, privacy. if you're an advertiser or if you're, you know, someone who's who wants to learn a lot about you, you're very interested in where people look, right? There are entire labs of eye tracking. That is a thing. And this right. yoke does eye tracking as part of its bread and butter. Mm-hmm. But the dev- the app does not get your eye position until you make the gesture to click. Oh, so the they don't see everywhere you're looking un- until you get there, until you select it? Until you interact. Okay. You actually click. So the OS is showing you what you're, cl- what you're positioned on by wiggling buttons and stuff, but the app doesn't know the buttons are wiggling. The app doesn't know anything until you click or it's, pinch your finger. It's, a, it's just such a shame that people do evil things with that information. But I think that's such useful information to a developer to know it took me you know, 15 seconds to find the right button that I went over here and I noticed this over here and I went down over there. Oh, there it is mm. way over on the right. Oh, maybe that's an important button. I should move it to the left as a developer. And I remember talking to a company at Macworld a hundred years ago where they were <laughs> selling a tool that would let you do this eye tracking on your app and it would let mm. you see where the, it basically create a heat map of where people had, not eye tracking, but where people had been moving their mouse or whatever. No, actually it was their eyes at the time. But everybody told them about it was like, no, oh, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> but it's so useful. There's no reason that you couldn't have, like you can give permission for a, an app like um, Text Expander to track your keystrokes. That's mm-hmm. a permission you give the app. And once you give the app the permission, it can read every keystroke in every app. You know, There's no cool reason they couldn't could, put similar. What if you could do that inside test flight? Like if you agree to test oh, my yeah. app, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for this permission. I am going to track your eyes, but I am not going to sell it. That seems very plausible. Like, that, and that is like being in a beta already gives different things, right? When yeah. you enroll your your device into a beta, different things happen. So that's entirely within Apple's security model. That doesn't break anything. But in terms of the day to day, the fact that Apple are already thinking before the thing has even launched to the public about how to protect your privacy, that immediately made my mind go, okay, this is not a half baked demo. Mm-hmm. This is very clearly a mature, a, an operating system with a lot of thought in it. And it's also, the more I watch the in-depth, so the third level deep of videos, these people have been using these APIs to write apps. Because they talk about when we did the music app, when we did the photos app, when we did, and they were talking about how they chose to use the APIs and it's really clear that these are people who have been working in this environment already, and now they're sharing with the developers this okay. amazing toolkit they've already been using. So, so I was the like, that learned. really impressed me. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So they started with the music app and then started mutating it, I assume, to the new um, language? Yeah, so that like is... That yes, vision. exactly. And so, the, you, yeah, so you should think about it. So remember I said that the point of Swift UI is that it is about, it's a declarative language. So you declare what something is. But each declaration has optional attributes. And those attributes are not the same across all devices. So that is why on the Mac, the same Swift UI code does slightly different things because you on the Mac can say, well, the Mac has a concept of a menu, which the iPad doesn't. Therefore, my Mac app has these extra optional bits of the UI that are only going to be visible on the Mac. And you just put them into your declaration and they get ignored by things that don't use them, but they're there in the Mac. So they're basically like, if you're writing functions with optional arguments, you just put in the optional arguments and on the iPad, the optional arguments for the iPad do a thing. And on the Mac, the optional arguments for the Mac do a thing. And in reality OS, Vision OS, there's different sets of optional bells and whistles that you can add to your declarative UI to say, and on Reality OS, I want you to. Da, 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 da. So I want you to draw me a menu that has a copy button, a paste button. On the Mac, I'm going to say, here's the options for the Mac. I want it to be at the top of the screen. 
or maybe I want it to be actually in the menu bar. You know the way you can do that in modern apps like Mail and stuff where the buttons are actually in the menu bar next to the traffic light. That's just an option you type in when you're doing your UI. Well, you would have another line underneath that that says, and on Vision OS, it's an adorn- it's a, an adornment. Adornment, yeah, yeah. And so you have defined that you will have a copy button, a paste button, and what it does when you click on them. And then you said on the Mac, the, this menu bar goes here, on Vision OS it goes there, on the iPad it goes there. So that's still declarative. But right, you can right. add effectively conditional statements, right? If I'm on the Mac, then do this extra thing. And so that's where the work is for the developer. So you, you, out of the box, you get an app that's already decent. But the spit and polish between a good app and a great app is doing those extra little things to make your Mac app more Mac-y and your iPad app more iPad-y, right? <laughs> Not just a bigger iPhone app. Right. And SwiftUI has all that capability. So that's what they want developers to focus on. So start with your iPad app and then make it better. Did they talk at all in any of this about how the Mac apps work in Vision OS? Because it's not really Vision OS when you're using your Mac to see things through this headset, right? You're actually, if you open numbers on your Mac with the Vision OS, the Vision headset, and you opened numbers inside Vision OS, they would be different. Yeah, they didn't go into that. To be honest, I didn't. I'm not saying there isn't a session that went into that detail, but none of the sessions I saw okay. did. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm picturing that being real interesting. Maybe you only switch to the Mac apps when there isn't a good Vision OS app, right? You wouldn't use numbers, or, or you prefer it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, using it in the flesh, because it's a bit like um, uh, Sidecar. Mm. It it reminds me a lot of the Sidecar feature, right? Where you can just bring your iPad next to your Mac and it becomes an external display. Well, in this case, you look at your Mac and you just sort of take its screen and then you have an external display for your Mac in (laughs) Vision OS, which is kind of like Sidecar, where suddenly you have Mac apps on an iPad. Now you have Mac apps in Vision OS, I'm so, just I'm yeah. just picturing take um Overcast which is an iOS app that doesn't run <laughs> on the iPad but Marco writes a, a Vision OS app but I actually end up using the Mac app which is a Catalyst app and I put that on the <laughs> Vision OS. <laughs> yes, the rabbit hole can go deep. <laughs> Let's Ooh, make the boy. worst user experience possible by doing that, right? And then I just I, I realize we're we're running we're running to the end of our time window here. But the last thing I just want to say that impressed me much is how clever they were about allowing you to be in this immersive world. It's not binary. It's not an I am immersed or I am not immersed. It's actually a spectrum of how immersed you want to be. And so you can have it that the real world is perfectly in shot, and your windows are exactly in the real world and you can choose to make them small so that they might only take up like you know 60 percent of your field of view or something and the real world is a hundred percent crisp right a hundred percent present so you're right. very unimmersed right but you dull the digital crown and you start to blur the background a little bit and so your virtual world becomes stronger and you can dial it all the way to go away universe <laughs> right, which is if you're in the cubicle farm, that's actually what you want, right? Go away universe. But it's a choice you have. And even if you're in the fully go away universe state, it's still detecting people. So human beings break through. Uh, Gruber described it as being like a force ghost. <laughs> He's a Star Wars fan. Uh, but not a spooky ghost. He was very careful to point out, like a force ghost, but not spooky, is how he described it in his piece. But the people who walk into the room break into your virtual world. And so you're never completely isolated. You you don't have this thing of being scared witless. <laughs> where, like a lot of people describe wearing Everybody's the quest or whatever and being, yeah, or walking into a wall. The other thing Gruber pointed out was that He was using it on the couch, very comfortable, really enjoying it. And they went, "Okay, now let's run the dinosaur app. And a portal opened up in the room and a dinosaur poked its head out. (laughs) And then they went, let's go look at the dinosaur. Stand up. And as soon as he stood up to walk, the coffee table in the fake living room came into his universe because it was an object that was in his way. That he needed to know about. (laughs) 
that he needed to know about. So oh, it's wow. constantly sensing your environment so your shins will not get, <laughs> you know, destroyed. And so he was able to see the coffee table, walk around the coffee table and then look into the portal and see the full dinosaur in its own little universe on the other side of the portal. And so, he said, and everything was fully rigid in the world. As he walked around, it was anchored huh. like it was real. Interesting. The, back to the um, it recognizing people. The example that they showed of somebody walking up and handing something to the woman that was working, uh, that was that seemed like a great use of that. I yeah. I know I keep just poking at what won't work, but I'm wondering, will my my dream of a happy person in a cubicle work? If it thinks that it's noticing these people that are on the other side of me, you know, less than six feet away inside of my cubicle. I wonder how that'll work. But it's visual, right? This whole thing is based on, on ah. processing what the sensors see. So the cubicle oh, is wall. your shield. Well, yeah, you might get the, the person across the aisle from you in the next cubicle. I guess it depends on how tall your cubicle is. But, or or uh, put, a, put a little curtain. <laughs> Well, I going to say, it's, I've seen all sorts of interesting use of box files and so forth when cubicle walls aren't high enough. <laughs> give me, give me some privacy. Of, yeah, I've seen a lot of, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it, is, it is surprisingly well thought out. And the other thing, of course, right, so from your point of view in the virtual universe, having the people break through and having the physical shin dangers break through is obviously for your benefit. Mm -hmm. But there's the inverse, right? I'm sitting in on my, I'm working from home. I'm sitting in my, my office and I'm staring at an empty wall. I've gotten rid of my very expensive Mac Studio display. I don't need it anymore. I now have infinity space. I'm working away at my desk. I'm using my keyboard. I'm using my trackpad because that all works fine. And my darling beloved walks in and I see him. But how does he know how deep I am in another universe? Mm -hmm. Well, that's why they put your eyes on the screen on the front of the darn thing. And the representation of your eyes goes from crystal clear, your eyes, which means I am in the least immersed mode, to barely recognizable, completely blurred out eyes, which means I am completely immersed. I have this thing dialed up to 11. And so it's actually very obviously visible to the person how deep you are in virtual reality. Okay, so that how deep you are doesn't change because the person walked into the room? I thought it did. All right. So when they when they become a force ghost, your representation of your eyes will also change to show that you have seen them. So they work in unison. Okay. I I, I don't understand this force ghost reference. I don't know what that is. So I don't quite know what you mean. But okay, ghost. It doesn't matter what kind of a ghost, right? In Star Wars, but when uh, the person walks in, a ghost. when the person walks in, it, you notice them, and and that would start to clarify your eyes to them. Precisely. So when okay. the headset notices the person, two things happen. They appear in your view and your eyes become more crystal at the same time in lockstep okay. with each other. So they're unlikely to see the fully blurred out view. Well, they, they will while they're more than six feet away, right? I, okay. I, I can't remember whether it's six feet. There's a distance that they walk okay. into to okay. break through. Got you, got you. So you can sit in a coffee shop and the street can be happening. Without, like, all of these random heads coming through PowerPoint or whatever, right? <laughs> well, yeah, so that gets back to the cubicle problem, right? That, that'll, be, right. Uh, that'll be an interesting difference. The thing I liked, again, what we've been talking about here is that it captures the imagination, what, this will, what you'll be able to do with it, where my imagination wasn't captured with the other ones. You know, it, it, someone else's imagination was, which was a bunch of floating avatars with no legs where, you know, Bob is a dinosaur and, and Sally's a hula girl, you know, or vice versa. You know, nothing wrong with that. Um, I, that's not an imagination that's got any value to me. It ditto. And to me, that's the thing, right? What am I going to do in spatial computing? Everything I do on my computer, I'm going to do in spatial computing, and I'm probably going to discover some bonus extras. As a pure bonus, I'm probably going to find things that I can do in a spatial OS that I can't do anywhere else, and I'm going to love them. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> I don't think anyone does, right? I, I, I've often heard described that when, when television was invented, it was radio with pictures, and people thought about television as being, well, we do a radio play, but we can see people. Or we do a theater yeah. presentation, 
but we broadcast it to people. And only later did people realize that we can do things here that we couldn't do in the, in the previous world. And that will be true of spatial computing. I don't know what it'll be, and a whole bunch of it probably won't interest me. Apparently the sports stuff was really impressive. I don't care, <laughs> but there'll be something. Probably, thinking about it logically, I want a planetarium map. Mm. I want stellar cartography from Star Trek. Hmm. And that is entirely compatible with this headset as designed. Interesting. So, well, and that's taking what is important to Bart and sports ball is important to Lindsay. You know, many people. Uh, many I, people. I want better Excel. <laughs> <laughs> pivot tables in 3D Look at me Ooh, Oh my god 3D pivot tables Yes that's exactly what I need it to be I need it to have that Z factor going on <laughs> But graphs in general can work much better If you can oh, animate yeah. them into a third dimension Oh yeah Yeah exactly Exactly So maybe we should end on talking Just a little bit about How did none of this freaking leak how did ah, it not? There's, there's, I mean, because there's no manufacturer yet. Okay, the, but there could have been the, the manufacturing leaks. of the hardware, but to I, know I, what I it was for. I don't think production. But I don't think it, they have demo units, which means that they're mm. handcrafted, right? Mm. Like, there's an, like, out, like whatever Johnny Ives's lab still exists, right? Johnny Ives mm. has gone off to do his own thing. But Johnny Ives' lab still exists, so they have manufacturing equipment to fabricate one-off prototypes. So they would have been building in-house these things. They haven't gone to a giant big factory and made a million of these yet. So that's why it hasn't leaked. I would well, imagine but, that today... But the hardware could have leaked, and you still wouldn't have known what it was for. That is also true. And that, yes, it's you're the absolutely OS right. meant... The humans held their lips in all ways, every in, in that Z direction, in all, in, you know, <laughs> spherically they did like it. Like Project Purple. I don't right? know what that is. The iPhone's OS was called Project Purple inside Apple. Oh. Like that was worked on for a very long time under, um, ah, what's his face? He left Apple over Apple Maps. Nice oh, guy. Didn't I know get on with mean. Tim Cook. Yeah. Oh, it's going to do my head in now. I'm going to think of his name in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Scott Forsall. There we go. Oh, there we Finally. Go. Penny dropped. Under Scott Forsell, Purple, Project Purple was what became iOS. That, that was five years in the making, and that's a secret too. Now, they actually had a, their own building. I would not be surprised if they took the Project Purple playbook, blew the dust off it, mm. and just repeated. Yeah. It I'm, I'm, just makes me so happy that nobody knew. I wanted to be mm. surprised for the first time. I mean, 15-inch MacBook Air. Yay! We knew that. You know? <laughs> mm. That was about it, but uh, I'm so pleased about it. And, and bits of the hardware did leak. Yeah, but like they the didn't digital make crown. Sense. Yeah, yeah. The digital crown leaked. The eyes leaked, but the eyes sound silly, right? The it has a screen in the front with your eyes. Is what? Um, oh, the guy who's so good at leaking stuff. Um, uh, oh, I knew who you mean. Uh, German. He he went to Bloomberg. Mark German. German. Mark German. Yeah. Like he, he had that, but it didn't make sense. It's like, what's that game where you have blind people trying to detect an elephant? It's like, I think it's a tree. No, you know, like we're all just feeling around. We don't know it's a trunk. We don't know it's tusks. We have no idea what it is. And when Apple put it all together, it's like, ah, OK, so the leaks were right. We just didn't understand. Now, I was really surprised how everybody that I talked to who just watched the keynote didn't notice that there was a scene where there was a, a man walked towards us and then turned his head and the eyes were out in front or in, you could see his eyes on the outside of the goggles. And then he turned his head and it got real weird. It was just a split second shot, but it looked real strange because you realized when you aren't looking straight at somebody, the eyes are displaced from the face. So if you're looking oh, straight at me, forward. it looks okay, but they're forward. So it was like the eyes were just wrong. I mean, has anybody posted well, pictures? I'm going to do a 3D effect. I, I wanted to get out my ski goggles and put some, some googly eyes on them and put them on for the live yeah. show. That would have been, I forgot to bring them to Lindsay's house, though, so I can't do it. That would be funny. That yeah, would be very funny. I, I can't believe I'd be the only person to think of it. But uh, anyway, 
Well, this is this yeah. is cool. This has been fun, Bart. I, I uh, see what you wanted to talk about. Now we did. I didn't actually know what we were talking about coming into this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I knew I wanted to talk to you about it, though. So, and thankfully, you trust me enough that when I say these things, you go, "Oh, sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah." My response was, "Yay, <laughs> sounds great." Whatever that is, that sounds and good. I, I didn't do up show notes, but what I will dig up because I, I think I think I was wise enough to bookmark the videos in my developer account. So I think I will be able to give you links to the. The, the videos I recommended. So oh, the, the chapter in the state of the platform, because that's chapterized, mm. and then the principles of spatial design. Those okay. are the most important ones. I'm, I'm glad you're going to do that because I was really, really bummed. I put in my calendar what time the uh, the State of the Union was, and I blocked off that time on my calendar to sit down and watch it. And I was dedicated to it. I was going to do it. I was going to watch it because I really enjoyed it the last couple of times. And they didn't, play it it was like recorded and then given to us later it wasn't it wasn't live i mean it didn't go live at the time they said it would it was on the schedule and it said on apple's website i was looking right at it the right time i'm in the right time zone so i didn't mess that up and it simply wasn't there and found out it was just recorded and given to us later it was like well yeah but it was recorded you know (laughs) Well, I'm so, wondering if the developer app might have had it in real time. Now, as it happens, real time doesn't work for me being on the wrong side of the Atlantic Ocean and the mm-hmm. continental United States. There's you know, a slight time zone problem. Um, so I always watch it in the developer app, but I don't know if the developer app would have given it to you live. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but in I do case, use the developer that was app. The, that was the time slot I had to dedicate to that. And I have not had a minute to myself that I could do it on ever since. So I will probably never watch, which makes me sad because I wanted to, but I know me. Well, the great thing is it's always there and it's chapterized, so you can jump around but that's uh, the and problem. you can easily skip. If it's always there, Bart, I'm not going to do it. It's never there. <laughs> I need it to be there always right when never. I'm signed up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, well I... You can I say, okay, tell Steve to put a thing in your calendar at a random time. <laughs> you <laughs> must sit down and watch this. <laughs> you must sit down and watch it now, yeah. And the Apple TV, by the way, is a fantastic place to have the developer app. Because it's just a perfect thing. You can just sit back in the couch and just actually watch them on, on the developer app and they'll remember your place and stuff. And can you do it on the developer app without a developer account? You absolutely can. Okay. If you have an Apple ID, you can just sign in and then it will sync your video position and your bookmarks between your, your Mac and everything else. Oh, you don't nice. have to, though. You just install the app. You can just watch every single presentation, all of them. Okay. You can even bookmark them, but they're local bookmarks because you're not signed in. So they'll only exist on the Apple TV. Which is probably fine, right? I wonder if but they've a, really lowered the barrier. Is there a developer app inside the Apple TV app on the Mac? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, better, well, the developer website, really. if you sign in, it'll sync all your stuff, right? So okay. there's a developer app for iOS, there's a developer app for Apple TV, and there's the Apple doc, the developer.apple.com website for the Mac. Okay. okay. And if you sign in with any Apple ID, you could just do it for free. You don't have to pay a cent. Mm-hmm. And they've actually made the betas free now as well. Even the developer betas are now free. So there's no need to pay for money unless you want to publish an app to the App Store. So and it's Bart, all free. Are you recommending that anyone put the developer beta on their production machine today? No. No, Thank I am you. bloody well not. It's called a <laughs> developer beta. And even when it goes to a public beta, yes, the word public is there, but there is also a second word. <laughs> beta. <laughs> Or beta. I don't care how you pronounce it. Don't install it on a production machine. Exactly. Definitely not one that your income depends on. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Bart, yeah. now I dare you to figure out how you're supposed to sign off. Oh, I'm definitely going to say happy computing on this one. I mean, wow. This is the <laughs> ultimate happy computing. The future of computing has been reinvented. How much happier does it get than that? I think I've ruined my ending. But anyway, until next time, when we're back to business as more usual, happy computing. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond Light. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad-supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you'd like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. You're only charged when I publish an episode of the NoSillaCast, which, let's face it, it's every single week, so I don't charge Patreon for Chit Chat Across the Pond Light or Programming by Stealth episodes. 
Another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the No Silla Castaways learn from you and takes a little bit of the load off of me doing all the work. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeet.com and I really encourage you to follow me on Mastodon at podfeet at chaos.social. Maybe you want to talk to the other No Silla Castaways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeet.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.